the examples I'm going to present today are biased towards paediatrics, but I hope I'm going to convince you that some of the things I'm uh, asking you to be interested in should also be applicable to uh, people over 18. So the things that I want you to learn from this session are to revise the main components of what is a PKPD model and um, understand how these components scale, which is very important in paediatrics, but I also believe is important in, in adult medicine as well. Um, I want to give you a rationale for why we use the statistical technique called mixed effects modeling when we fit pharmacokinetic models. Um, and I want you to recognize the three components of a population mixed effects pharmacokinetic model, the structural, the statistical, and the covariate model, so that when you read these papers in the BJCP on population PK, you can start to understand whether that's a useful model that you may or may not want to apply to your clinical practice. And finally, and related to that, I want to tell you how you should evaluate population PKPD models. So first I'm going to talk about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, uh, parameter estimation methods, the population approach, and model evaluation. And in the, those first sections, there's a lot of Greek and equations and things that a lot of people might find boring. So I'm going to finish and try to spend much more time on some case studies at the end. So you can see why all of this is important to you. So pharmacokinetics, you, I'm sure you wouldn't be here if you, if you didn't know all this anyhow, but it's split into three, four, four processes, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. This is my, my picture of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Uh, as you can see, most of the drug is absorbed from the small intestine. And when, we're interested, when we think about absorption, people do say, oh, well, we want to know about rate, rate of absorption, but it's only really important for a very narrow range of drugs. For example, onset of action of painkillers, you don't want it to be a modified release or enteric coated tablet. But essentially, the main thing we're interested in, in terms of absorption, is the bioavailability, which we call F and it just can take values between zero and one. So one means all of the drug gets into the body, zero means none of it gets in. And it can be further decomposed into the fraction that's absorbed from the GI tract, the fraction that escapes gut metabolism and the fraction that escapes hepatic metabolism. But just remember, when we think about absorption, we're really generally thinking about bioavailability. Drug then has to distribute to a site of action, um, it's also metabolized, mainly in the liver, but also in other places. And then it's eliminated, usually by the kidneys. Water-soluble metabolites are eliminated by the kidneys. There's some hepatic uh, elimination. So this is all easy stuff. So I want you to now think about some pharmacokinetic data that we might see. So we've measured some concentrations with time. And... I want you to recall the one compartment IV bolus model. It's a mathematical model. So we've seen the, um, the system that generated these data in the last slide. Now we want to fit an equation that fits these data. So we can use this equation to predict things that are useful. Okay. And when I say predict things that are useful, I mean we want to predict if the pharmacological effect is driven by attaining a certain threshold we might want to predict the maximum concentration. We might want to predict the overall exposure, the AUC, the integral of the, the curve. Or if we want to know about dose frequency, we want to predict the half-life. So we've got the concentration at some time is given by the initial concentration um, multiplied by this e to the minus kT, an exponential decay with an elimination rate constant and time. I've said all those things. So the pharmacokinetic parameters, the model parameters that we're interested in, are things like uh, volume of distribution, elimination rate constant, and remember that the elimination rate constant is given by the ratio of clearance over volume. Okay, so V, C, L, and K are model parameters, although 
there's only two parameters there because CL can be derived from K and V and all this sort of stuff. And we've got things from the observations. We, we observe concentrations and we know the covariates, dose and time. So which pharmacokinetic parameter do we need to estimate C max? So the maximum concentration is going to be when the time is zero. So when, when T is zero, so when E to the zero is one, then the concentrate, so at, at the very first time point, this is where you've got your maximum concentration, one compartment IV bolus, then the, um, the concentration is just C naught, which is dose, which you know divided by volume. If we think about an orally absorbed drug, then also we need to think about bioavailability, um, absorption rate, but essentially it's the volume of distribution that determines the maximum concentration. Okay? Bit of a harder one now. How about the integral of the curve, the AUC? AUC is dose over clearance. The only parameter you need to know for AUC is the clearance. And you can remember that by the fact that clearance is in volume per time and AUC is in milligrams liters per hour. So if you dose divided by the clearance is the volume per time. So for the, for the exposure, the integral of the curve, we only need to know the clearance. We don't need to know anything about volume of distribution. And to work out the half-life, we need to understand the elimination rate constant, which is the ratio of the clearance to the volume. These are the parameters that are often related to drug effect. So when we want to understand the dose, concentration, effect relationship, that's why we need to understand these parameters. So a question for you is, how do volume, clearance, and half-life scale with both size and age? And as I say, these are some examples from pediatrics, but... Um, you're going to see some adult examples as well. So um, volume distribution tends to scale in a linear way with body weight. If you double someone's volume, in general, you double their... If you double someone's volume, uh, body weight, you double their volume distribution. So in the context of a drug that relies on Cmax, then we can just dose by milligrams per kilogram. Clearance does not double with body weight. So someone who's twice as big doesn't have twice the clearance, okay? Children and smaller people have bigger livers and bigger kidneys and bigger blood flows to their livers per kilogram. So we see this a lot, um, actually. This is um, lamivudine clearance versus age, and the units are liters uh, per hour per kilogram. So here it's been scaled in a linear way, and what we see is that the children, the two-year-olds, appear to have higher clearances than the adolescents. So they do have higher clearances per kilogram of body weight. Okay. And what we've known since 1950, a pediatrician called Crawford, and before that with um, scaling laws in biology, that um, clearance follows this um, allometric, or which is very close to body surface area <coughs> law. Okay. So if we take the adult clearance, the 70 kilo clearance, and we scale down linearly, then we would expect the child's clearance to be here. But in fact, it's up here somewhere. It follows very closely the body surface area. Why do we dose narrow therapeutic index drugs like cancer chemotherapy by body surface area and not body weight? It's because clearance scales with body surface area. And clearance is the AUC. You only need to know the dose and the clearance to understand the exposure, the AUC. And exposure is what drives drug effect in 90% of cases. So we dose narrow therapeutic index drugs by body surface area because of this. And we're very interested in it in paediatrics because we routinely have very large weight ranges. On a neonatal ward, we can even have a tenfold weight range from 450 grams to 4.5 kilos. So in adult medicine, you, you're less used to having big weight ranges, but it is important to understand this stuff. This, this works, but down to about age two years, just to scale with body surface area, but then we get maturation going on. And those of you who work in paediatrics will know about this, and those of you that don't may not be too interested. So here what I've done is I've plotted how clearance, volume, and half-life change with both weight and age. So we can see that we've got maturation and then this non-linear clearance value. We've got linear scaling of volume with weight, 
And what this means is that an, a neonate has a very long half-life. The half-life rapidly drops as the child gets bigger or older. And then the half-life in the um, infants and the young children is shorter than in the adults and the bigger people. And the reason it's shorter is because they have a bigger clearance per body surface, per body weight. But th th it is, this is relevant to adults, and um, we're going to have a small aside here. This is a note to the editors of the BMJ. Um, maybe I think this is being videoed, so maybe one of them will ever watch it one day. Um, so since, as I said before, since um, 1950, a paediatrician called Crawford uh, knew that we clearanced scales in this body surface area, and it's probably something to do with metabolic rate and things like this. And um, I got very excited, it was about 2008, I got very excited because I saw some pharmacokinetics in the BMJ. Um, it says maternal caffeine, so this is um, pregnant women not allowed to smoke, not allowed to have a glass of wine, now they're not even allowed to have a cup of tea because um, they've measured people's caffeine half-life and people with faster, ha shorter half-lives apparently had smaller babies. So coffee and tea leads to... Um, fetal growth restriction. This was the, um, this was the conclusion. And you, you may not be able to read this, but I'll read it out. It says, caffeine half-life brackets proxy for clearance was determined by measuring caffeine in the saliva. And so what they said was the people with the shorter half-life must have a fat, higher clearance. They're going to make more metabolites that, that are leading to growth restriction. But as you now know from the previous slides, half-life changes with body size. So this is a weight range of between 40 and 80 kilos, and this is the change in half-life that you'd expect. So another conclusion to finding a shorter half-life is that, when smaller babies, is that smaller women have smaller babies. And this is something quite well known as well. So maternal weight is quite well correlated with fetal weight. And I want to talk a little bit about how we scale hepatic metabolism um, because a lot of drugs are metabolized by um, enzymes in the, in the liver. And I'm asking you to recall, but probably maybe see for the first time, the um, well-stirred model of the liver. Okay? And we have this concept called the extraction ratio, which is given by the intrinsic capacity of the liver to metabolize drugs divided by the liver blood flow, QH, plus the intrinsic capacity. Now, the intrinsic capacity, this intrinsic clearance, is just the ratio of Vmax to Km. So it's, the, um, it's directly proportional to enzyme abundance. So if you've got loads and loads of cytochrome P450 enzymes, your intrinsic clearance is very, very high. Okay? And if it's very, very high, much higher than liver blood flow, then you can see that this expression is very close to 1. Okay, so let's say the intrinsic clearance was like 100,000 litres per hour, and who knows what a typical liver blood flow is. Okay, but let's say in, a, in an adult, that's about around 100 litres per hour, something like that. Okay, so you can imagine if this number is very big compared with 100, then this whole expression is close to 1. And so the hepatic clearance is just hepatic blood flow times by one. All of the drug you can deliver to the liver is, is metabolized at its maximum rate. So the, the clearance just goes down to the hepatic blood flow. Okay? So as I say, intrinsic clearance is proportional to enzyme abundance. Enzyme abundance is proportional to liver volume, which scales allometrically. Smaller people have bigger liver sizes. Hepatic blood flow scales allometrically. Um, and so if we've got a very high intrinsic clearance, changing the intrinsic clearance a little bit, for example with a genetic polymorphism, doesn't actually change extraction ratio. So we have to take into account function as well as, um, as, well as for example, genotypes. And as I said before, we have these maturational effects in children. So maturation or genetic polymorphisms may change the extraction ratio due to the changes in intrinsic clearance. It may be a bit confusing, this, so we've got an example at the very end to, um, to show you what this means. 
These scaling laws I've talked to you about seem to follow for a lot of different types of agents. So it seems that biologics scale allometrically. Here's um, infliximab, uh, again, age versus linear clearance, and we've got this drop. And if you um, plot the um, clearance versus the estimated basal metabolic rate, which follows body surface area, we have a positive linear relationship. So biologics seem to scale by this body surface area way. And here's another example from the literature. So th there's something about type 2 diabetics, which means they need higher doses of their uh, TB medicines. What can you think the something might be about these type 2 diabetics? Is it some fancy biological mechanism? Or is it the fact that the um, bigger people have bigger clearances, they need bigger doses because they have bigger livers and bigger blood flows, okay? So that's scaling of pharmacokinetics and hopefully understanding those principles can help you with dosing decisions in the clinic, I hope. Now we're gonna talk about pharmacodynamics. So pharmacodynamics is all about the law of mass action. Um, so we've got the um, drug being in some kind of equilibrium with the receptor and um, causing a pharmacological effect. And from the law of mass action, you can derive the Emax model, the Hill curve, which some of you may or may not have seen. And so the effect is proportional to the maximum possible effect multiplied by the drug concentration divided by the EC50 plus the drug concentration. And when we plot the site of action concentration versus the effect, we get this S-shaped curve. And it becomes more S-shaped the more uh, the higher this Hill coefficient, this gamma is, and the EC50 gives you the concentration required to give you half the effect. Okay, so that's that's fundamental piece of pharmacology. Um, when we're modelling time courses of pharmacodynamic effects, we have to take into account that the pharmacokinetic curve goes up then down. So we've got dynamic concentrations. Perhaps the site of action concentration might follow this very simple hill curve. Um, but if we have a slight delay, in other words, if the um, target is not in the circulation, if it needs to distribute out somewhere, um, and we just plot the concentration versus the effect, we get to what's called hysteresis, where we've got two different observed effects at the same drug concentration. Very quickly, PKPD data gets complicated like this. And this is why we have to fit mathematical models to it to, in order to understand it. Because if you just plotted the observed concentration versus the effect, you'd be very confused. Okay, so mathematical models can help us with this. That's all I want to say about pharmacodynamic modeling. So now I want to talk to you about analysis, how we um, fit models to data. So, We've got, imagine some pharmacokinetic data that comes from lots of different patients. And this is how a statistician would write the um, pharmacokinetic model, the statistical model. You'd say you've got some observations Y, <coughs> and they come from a number of individuals. So let's say we have 10 individuals, and each of those individuals has J samples. So let's say each of the individuals has four samples. So then to work out which observation you're looking at at which time, then Y12 would be the observation from individual, the second observation from individual one, okay? And the, the main question that you want to think about when you want to um, fit a model to some pharmacokinetic data is how do we work out, do the regression, it's a regression problem, to find the best values of your model parameters? So it's a nonlinear function usually, um, with things like clearance and volume distribution. And we want to work out what is the clearance in the population, okay? What is the volume distribution in the population? So the first approach could be to just pool all the data together and fit them all together at once and uh, ignore the fact that they come from lots of individuals. The second approach would be to take an average at each data point and fit a model to that average. Another approach would be the two-stage approach, whereby we fit the model to each individual at each time, so we find out what each individual's clearance and volume is, and then we do summary statistics at the end. Or the final approach 
is the mixed effects model, which the concept here is that we fit a single model to all patients at once, but we don't lose the um, concept that they come from different individuals. So what we do is we have a second, this is one variability term, a residual variability, we have a second variability term at the level of the model parameters. So we allow the clearance to change between individuals. Okay, we allow the volume to change in between individuals. And I just want to briefly tell you about the pros and cons of these methods. So here what I've done is we've got some simulated pharmacokinetic data. It's from a one-compartment oral model. And um, here we've got rich data, so there are more subjects per sample uh, samples per subject than there are model parameters, and it's even or balanced in that there is the same number of samples per individual. And when I fitted each of those models using each of those different approaches, there's a, there's a grey curve that you can't really see, which is the true model. All of those approaches catch the average trend quite well. Okay, So if we've got rich bioequivalence type data from healthy volunteers, balanced, Actually, and you're only interested in the average trend, you don't have to do, use fancy methods, okay? The problem is that often we don't have these kind of data because we want to do research in patients or in phase three trials where we can only take two or three samples per individual. So when I say sparse data, which is a very typical problem in uh, PKPD modeling, um, is that we've got fewer samples per subject than we have model parameters. So we can't really identify the model in each patient. And furthermore, they might be um, taken at different time points. So you can still see there's the same underlying trend, it's just a, the same simulated model, but, um, and each of the different colors and shapes comes from a different uh, subject. But now what you can see is um, the two-stage approach fails because we can't identify all the model parameters in each of the individuals. The averaged approach fails because we haven't got all the samples at the same time point. But actually still, the um, naive pool, where we've just imagined they all came from the same individual, and the nonlinear mixed effects model, both catch the average trend quite well. So we could still use naive pool, provided that we had the same number of samples per individual, to catch the average trend. The problem with the naive pooled approach is that it overestimates the variability because it's only got one variability term. It doesn't separate out the fact that we've got inter-individual variability at the level of the parameters and residual variability. So here what we've got is the dotted lines are the um, percentiles of the observed data and the shaded areas are 95% confidence intervals of simulated data. So what you can see is the uh, naive pooled approach overestimates variability whereas the nonlinear mixed effects modeling properly handles the variability. So I hope from that I've convinced you that we need to use this um, nasty nonlinear mixed effects modeling in order to analyze population level PKPD data. And I want, you to, I want to just talk to you um, a little bit about um, what I, a bit more detail on what POTPK is, and then we'll go on to model evaluation. So a population PK model, or PD model, has three major components. The first one is the structural model. So the structural model is what we've seen before, like the one compartment pharmacokinetic model, or it can be an effect um, model if it's a pharmacodynamic, or it can be the, the two. We might have pharmacokinetics predicting this concentration. Um, and the structural part gives you the average trend. Okay, We have a statistical part that is split into at least two, but sometimes three different variance terms. We've got the inter-individual variability at the level of the model parameters. If we're interested in using the model for therapeutic drug monitoring, we want to know how that parameter changes in an individual on different occasions. So we might have inter-occasion variability. And then we have the residual variability because all models are wrong, it's always a simplification of the system, and the model will always slightly miss the data. And finally, we have the covariate model, which is once we've developed the statistical and structural model, we can start to look for factors that explain and minimize the unexplained variability. So perhaps we might want to add body weight in a 
sensible way to drug clearance in order to understand why some individuals are having different clearances than others. Okay, and there are lots of specialist and general statistical software that can be used to handle this. Most people use one called NonMem. I've provided some stats in the next three slides, which I'm not going to go over, but please feel free to read them in your own time. So in summary, at the end of a population nonlinear mixed effects modeling approach, what we have is the typical values for the model parameters. For example, the population value of the clearance, the volume, the Ka, and these are sometimes called mu or thetas in, in the software. We have the variances at the level of the model parameters, and we have the variances of the residual error. And we estimate these by something called maximum likelihood. And it, again, there are several algorithms available and several software to do them, to, to estimate those parameters. So one last bit of tough stuff before we come on to the interesting case studies. How do we evaluate a population PKPD model? Um, a lot of it is done graphically. All models are wrong, so we have to just see if uh, something's useful or not. So one thing we do is plot the model predictions versus the observations. And we would like to see the perfect model, the points would lie on the line of unity. The difference between these two plots is this is the population average model that you would get from the naive pooled, and this is allowing the parameters to change per individual. So this is the individual prediction compared with the population average prediction. Another thing that we look at and statisticians look at are standardized residuals. So what we do is we take the um, observed data and we minus the model predicted data. So we get a difference between the observations and the predictions. And then we divide it by the square root of a variance, which is a standard deviation. Okay. So all you need to know about residuals are that they should follow a standard normal distribution with a mean of zero, which means they go through the middle of the data, and a variance of one. So 95% of the data should be between plus and minus two standard deviations. So we look at plots of these. And here I've fitted, this is um, some Cormoxiclav data that we looked at from some children in, in intensive care. When I fitted a one compartment model, you can see there's a clear trend in the residuals with time after dose. Whereas when I fitted a three compartment model, there was no trend. And we, we assume, so this, this model on average goes through the middle of the data and is evenly distributed. So this, this plot helped us to show that we should use a three compartment model rather than a one compartment model. You've seen a little bit of the simulation based diagnostics. Most population PK papers will, will have them now. This is what's called a visual predictive check. So we get our model at the end, which has got these means and variance terms and we do simulations, so we just draw randomly from those parameters. And then we can draw 95% confidence intervals of the percentiles of the data. And then, so that's the shaded areas, and then we overlay the observed data, and what we want to see is that the lines of the observed data lie within the shaded areas. If they do, the model simulates well, and we can use it to simulate what would happen under different dosing conditions. So we can come up with dose recommendations, for example. So I hope I've not put you all off PKPD for life. And to, for those of you that I have, I want to try and rescue the situation with some case studies. These are based on questions that have been asked, and sometimes we've um, done studies and um, sometimes we've just answered them. So I'm going to focus on the ones that are not published, and you can maybe look up the, the published ones. So the first one was um, around five years ago now, when Posicon was always first licensed, and our BMT team said, um, we've got this new drug called Posiconazole, this new antifungal, um, and we have resistance in our immunocompromised patients. So we want to start using posaconazole in certain circumstances, uh, but it's never been given to a child. So what dose should we use? And the information that we know is, well, we knew the adult dose. And if you do a bit of reading, you can find out that it's mainly hepatically metabolized <coughs> by glucuronidation. Um, we know how uh, hepatic metabolism 
normally scales with size, with allometric scaling, body surface, close to body surface area. So we can predict the dose down to about two years. And luckily, for glucuronidation, we know all about the maturation of glucuronidation from studies in paracetamol and morphine. So we know this maturation function, which was on one of the slides before. So what we did was we used this information to predict the dose. And so um, we may, from, from a, a very simple model, just, I mean, it's, there's no nonlinear mixed effects here. This is just scaling with weight. You needed a scientific calculator to be able to raise something to the power 0.75, but that was it. Um, and so now we've plotted the age versus the milligrams per kilogram dose. And from that, we just made a few bins and said, okay, well, um, for this age group, give this dose. So this was in the, um, the Great Ormond Street Antimicrobial Guidelines for a year or two before posiconazole was eventually, before we had proper data. And actually these doses were very similar to the licensed doses in the end. Here's one. Um, we, our medicine information department had a call. Um, there was a, 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 a slight overdose of cl <coughs> clonidine, which is a, a sedative agent. Um, and they want to know, okay, well, how, how quickly can we expect recovery? So quick PubMed search yielded PA from Karolinska, who's a, these days a very well-respected pediatric intensivist. Um, in those days, he was a PhD student, and he did some PKPD on clonidine. And he published a very, very nice model, actually. This is, a, this is how simple PKPD can be. Um, so here is the clonidine concentrations. You see it's sort of a two-compartment model. This is a log scale. Uh, you can see it's got a very long half-life, clonidine. And here is the um, mean arterial blood pressure, how it drops at the same rate as concentration. And so we've got a pharmacodynamic. There was no, no apparent hysteresis, so there was no real... Um, gap between the observed concentration and the drop in blood pressure so we can just use concentration directly to predict blood pressure from this model and so look at this equation it's some people when they look at maths they get scared but just look carefully at it okay mean arterial blood pressure equals a plus b times an exponential term so let's understand this equation from when time is zero what's e to the zero one. We learned that earlier, right? So at time is zero, the mean arterial blood pressure is A plus B. Okay? Now, as this number gets big, E to a negative number, what, what's E to a big negative number getting close to? Zero. Yeah. So as uh, concentration and time get big, this disappears, so this becomes zero, and the blood pressure is A. So A is actually the drop in blood pressure. And um, when the drug is washed out, so when concentration becomes zero again, E to the zero, we're back to where we started, A plus B. Okay? So we could just use this model to say, okay, well, we think this is going to be the time course of patient recovery. Here's a published example from um, some anaesthetists. they um, using in craniofacial surgery they're using remifentanil for sedation. And the reason they're using remifentanil is that they want to decrease bleeding in the operative field. Craniofacial surgery, lots of blood. Surgeons can't see what they're doing. Remifentanil opiates are going to drop your mean arterial blood pressure. What's the concentration effect relationship? Don't know. So I had to do a study. So we, what we did was we collected some data, some uh, remifentanil concentrations and some mean arterial blood pressure concentrations. And then we fitted a pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic model. And using various metrics, we worked out that a sigmoidal Emax model was the best. And you can see this graphically in that the, these are the predicted mean arterial blood pressures versus the observed mean arterial blood pressures. And this sigmoidal Emax model uh, catches the very low values. The Hill coefficient here was quite high. So what we were able to tell the anaesthetist was that because you can program the pumps, the, you know, these people have pharmacokinetically guided dosing. So if you aim for a certain target concentration, somewhere close to the EC50, you're going to get sudden drops in 
um, mean arterial pressure. So we can give them a range where to initially target and tell them to be careful about how they titrate things from the model. That helps us to understand that. In this case, there was hysteresis. And when you plotted concentration versus blood pressure, you couldn't see what was going on. You had to model the data to understand the relationship. So we, um, we did this work mainly to look at how, um, it was with some oncologists at UCLH, how to look at um, <coughs> mucositis caused by methotrexate. So um, these patients who are on, uh, being treated for osteosarcoma have high dose methotrexate, 12 grams per meter squared, which is very, very high dose methotrexate. And the, they have it two weeks at the end of a six week cycle and mucositis is what makes them postpone the next cycle. And um, So in, in, this, in this example, if you look at the publication, we were mainly focusing on the relationship between the AUC and mucositis and we did show a slight relate, significant relationship but actually, a much more practical thing came out of it. We said, well, well, now you've got this pharmacokinetic model, can we use it to um, predict when to stop the hydration, when to give folinic acid rescue, and when to send the patients home because the patients were sitting around waiting for their level to go less than 0.2? And of course, we can. So we um, implemented this in Excel. So we got the population PK model. and we read in some covariates from the patient, their renal function, their uh, first few measure measurements, and we use the model to do what's called a, a maximum a posteriori Bayesian prediction. So in this case, you've got two observations and the predicted trajectory that says you can go home tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We've got children with Crohn's disease. Uh, they don't grow properly in adolescence, uh, even if you give them growth hormones. So we want to try to supplement them with uh, exogenous recombinant insulin-like growth factor. Problem is that high levels uh, predispose you to various cancers and these patients are already predisposed to colon cancer in, in later life. So we want to work out what's the best dose of IGF-1 um, to then take forward into a planned randomized controlled trial. You can look at the paper, but we basically fitted a, a mechanistic model. It fitted the data quite well and we were able to show what the dose should be for the big trial. Finally, to finish, I want to just give you one example from the literature that I've seen. So is variability all about your genes? From your um, talk this morning, probably you think if you know someone's genotype, you can predict the future, right? So here's Takahashi from uh, Pharmacogenomics and Genetics, um, about three or four, oh no, 2006 now, probably it's quite, quite a few years old. But um, So we have noticed that the dosing requirements a similar degree of anticoagulation varies across populations and appears to be related to racial ancestry. You know, so we've got CYP2C9, VKRC1 that we need to genotype everyone for. And uh, table one of the, the paper, we can see that the African Americans need 5.3 milligrams of warfarin per day. The uh, Caucasians need 4.7 milligrams of warfarin per day. This is the dose needed to keep you in your INR range. And the Japanese only need 3.5. So it does seem that there's a different dosing with the different ethnicities. But then we look at the line above, which is body weight. And here we have around 90 kilos for the African-Americans, 73 kilos for the Caucasians, and 56 kilos for the Japanese. So when we divide the dose by the body weight, everyone has 0 0.06 milligrams per kilogram because these people have got bigger livers, so they need bigger doses. The genotype predicts outliers. There's the odd outlier who will be predicted by some one in a hundred, one in a thousand genotype. But when you're dosing warfarin, don't just give everyone 10 milligrams on the first three days and then titrate to the INR, whether they're a 40 kilo little old lady or a 120 kilo rugby player. So I'd just like to say thank you to Julie Bertrand who gave me some inspiration for some of these slides. And finally, um, I've been very lucky to get a, an MRC fellowship and Medical Research Council does seem to fund this kind of stuff. So if you're interested to do research in this field, please do get in touch.